but but you and I know that you know you're just spreading a contagion. It's not like you're uh, eliminating it. Now you've got more material to to uh, uh, dispose of over a much larger area. So a lot of it is going into landfills, which of course will then get into the groundwater and, and et cetera. Uh, Tokyo Bay is also another um, landfill that's uh, accepting uh, radioactive cesium. And they are seeing radioactive cesium in the water in Tokyo Bay now. Yeah, but you're talking about incineration and only the radiation left in the ash. But you haven't mentioned that the fact when you incinerate stuff, it goes up the chimney, out into the air, and they're they're spreading, dispersing radioactive materials throughout the air in Japan through this incineration. Well, and the incinerators, there's, there, there are modern incinerators that would trap a lot of that gases that go up, um, and uh, they really need things called electrostatic precipitators and bag houses to capture it all. But very few of the incinerators that are in use right now are using those, uh, those uh, devices. So we're seeing radioactivity go up these stacks and also get concentrated in the air. So uh-huh. either way, it's, it's not a good thing. Now... The ne- uh, okay, so that's only cesium, but Arnie, you and I know <laughs> that not not just cesium got out, but a whole slew of other radioactive elements got out. It, but they only measure cesium. What about all the rest? Yeah, there's um, uh, that's really important. Uh, Doctor Saji, who used to work for the, um, the the regulator, now he's a retired independent consultant. <clears throat> just finished some calculations on. Um, the airborne gases that left the reactor in the first day or two. And and it's not iodine-131 that his, he was tracking. He was tracking iodine-133, which is much uh, a much bigger health concern, but it's got like a two-day half-life, so it disappears in a week or two. So nobody had a chance to check it. But when the, when the kids absorbed it into their thyroid it likely was a major contributor to thyroid dose that went totally undetected by the system Mm. because by the time the authorities got around to looking, it was gone. Mm. And he said he was appalled by the calculations that he did that uh, that indicate very high thyroid doses from 133 iodine. Then there was the xenon and krypton cloud, and those concentrations over the United States were 40,000 times higher than, uh, than normal. So God knows what, what they were like over the Fukushima prefecture. And we talked about that, uh, I think, two shows ago, where you know the, uh, the xenon and krypton gases are fat-soluble and, uh, um, and decay away in a relatively short period of time. But when they do decay away, they do a lot of cellular damage. All of those exposures, the iodine, the, sea, the uh, uh, Zedon and the Krypton exposures um, are neglected in any of the calculations the Japanese are doing because it was gone by the time they got to the scene of the crime. Yes, and Xenon decays not away. It decays to cesium, and Krypton decays to strontium. Yes, which brings you to your other question about the... the I, I just answered half of that, which is your short-lived ones that nobody was paying attention to. But the, the long-lived ones, like you know, like your strontiums, and, and oh my God, there's an alphabet soup of, of other radioactive material out there, inclu- including you know, plutonium and americium and uranium. Um, all of those remain in the environment on the surfaces and uh, are much harder to detect than cesium. So you hear about these surveys on cesium, and the reason they're surveying for cesium is it's the easy to detect isotope. But all the other ones are lurking there too and are not being uh, accounted for. Why is cesium so easy? Because it gives off a very strong gamma signal? Yes. And the other ones are alphas, and, and it's very, you have to have very special equipment to detect alphas, which are particulates made of two protons and two neutrons. And alphas can be blocked by a sheet of paper. So they're very hard to measure alpha emitters. And when they get into your body, of course, there's no sheet of paper to block the alpha particle from damaging your chromosome in your cell and causing cancer. Um, Arnie, what's the population of the Fukushima prefecture? 
Uh, approximately four million people. Four million people. And and of course, during the the excav the, the evacuation was poorly planned, and um, a lot of the people uh, were pushed into areas where the plume was actually greater. Yeah. So there's so then during the first three or four days of the accident, people evacuated areas that were not low but lower, and actually moved into areas that were higher. Oh, yeah. And while the Japanese government knew that was happening, they didn't share that with their own population. Now, they're finding, I think, 3% of children in, that have, of, of the few children they've tested in Fukushima province, 3% have thyroid tumors. Uh, is that the accurate number now, Arnie? Um, the number I heard was 30%. 30%. Um, they tested uh, 3,000 kids. And more than a thousand came up with not tumors; they called them lumps. Well, let, um, let me explain from a medical perspective. Um, if you don't take out the lump, you don't know. Well, you can, by ultrasound, determine if it's a cyst or a solid tumor. Um, to find thyroid lumps in children uh, is extremely, extremely rare. I don't know in my medical practice in pediatrics if I've ever seen one. Maybe I have, just one. Um, so you would have, number one. Number two, the latent period of carcinogenesis, in other words, the time it takes for a thyroid tumour to appear is very short in this instance. It's only a year. But as children are very, very sensitive to radiation, um, you may, you know, this is new, I guess, in the history of pediatrics. You may be already seeing thyroid tumors. And to to actually know what these lumps are, you need to take them out. Now, a cyst can have um, cancer cells in it, number one, and the solid uh, tumors, a tumor is just a, a, a collection of cells, that has grown, um, probably quite a few of them will be cancers. So do you know what they're doing with these children, these 30% of children that were tested and others that have thyroid lumps, Arnie? Yeah, well, they're finding them with um, ultrasonic techniques. They're sending in a sound wave and they're imaging the thyroid. But are they taking the, them out? The lumps, or? Are, the lumps are on the order of five millimeters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, so now, the only thing they're doing right now is just monitoring it. What do you uh, mean, waiting no, till like, a, waiting till the cancer spreads into their bones and they die? I mean, the the way uh, one way you could do it is by a fine needle biopsy. You stick a very fine needle into the lump, and you extract some cells and and examine them under the microscope. Or if it's a cyst, extract extract the fluid and look at the cells in the fluid and then you can make the diagnosis of what this particular pathology is and without that if they're just monitoring them and waiting for the thing to spread without knowing histologically or pathologically what these tumors are that is <laughs> I can't tell you how uh, irresponsible that is medically it's just terrible well the, the only piece of good news there is that at least the government is beginning to monitor thyroids on kids, but but you're right. That's just uh, the tip of the iceberg. If uh, and to see one third of the kids test positive for oh. lumps in their thyroid, um, oh. and we're only you know ten months into the accident here. Oh, um, uh, that's the, that forebodes some real thyroid issues in the uh, in the future. How many people do you think now? through the retrospectoscope, Arnie Gunderson should have been evacuated from areas they now live in that are too hot to really be occupied? I, I think they should have evacuated about a quarter of a million to uh, uh, 350,000 people. Uh, in fact, they, uh, they they moved out about 100,000. So um, the, um, the, the, the number of people... And even there, Helen, it's not clear whether they evacuated them because of the tsunami or mm. because of the, the accident. You know, mm. there's a lot of people on the move in Japan after the accident, in part because their homes were destroyed by the tsunami. Mm. And on top of that, you had the, the, the people downwind from the accident. You know, and I think I have been saying this for almost a year now. Um, it's hard to imagine, but Japan is lucky because 80% of the time the wind was blowing offshore. Mm. So all these problems we're talking about are only one-fifth 
of what could have happened if the wind was blowing across the island as opposed to offshore. Oh, goodness. And now what about other areas apart from Fukushima Prefecture? The wind blew towards the northwest and also blew south. Tokyo's got some very hot areas. Um, how many other people do you think are, are living in dangerous areas, Arnie? Uh, um, you know, more than half of the population of Japan are in areas that are contaminated. More than half? Um, more than half, yeah. Mm-hmm. Essentially, you know, if you're even um, 400 kilometers away, you're seeing contamination. So it's essentially the very southern parts of Japan that are uh, almost radiation-free if you exclude what's what's in the ocean. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the, the long-term consequences to the entire coast of Japan will be from uh, coastal contamination from the, the currents moving up and down the, uh, the coast. But and right now the airborne um, seems to have uh, contaminated within oh, 400 kilometers of the, uh, of the site. And what we're seeing, Helen, is a lot of that is now you know, washing out to sea, and we're seeing rivers becoming, the, the sediment in rivers, becoming more and more contaminated with cesium, far from the accident, because it's going to concentrate, as it runs out of the hills, it's going to concentrate in the river sediment, and then the river sediment's going to get eaten by things that then work their way up the food chain. So even in freshwater fish, um, as far away as a couple hundred kilometers away, we're beginning to see uh, cesium in the uh, in the tissues of freshwater fish. And the Japanese love their fish, and they love eels. I love smoked eels in Japan. And they say 63% of the fish caught in the Pacific now around Japan is is showing cesium. Is that correct, Arnie Gunderson? Um, yes, I don't know too much about it, though, Helen. I'm sorry. No, but that's what they're saying at Woods Hole and other places. One of the reasons I wanted to interview you so badly this time, Arnie, was was that wonderful tape that you put on on Fair Winds, uh, your your website, to show that um, girls, uh, little girls, are five times more sensitive to the effects of radiation than little boys. I don't know why that's so. And that because the Japanese government allowed the population to be exposed to 20 millisieverts, um, which is two REMs a year, these girls are at great risk of getting cancer. Uh, do you want to talk about that, Arnie? Yeah. Uh, we, that was. I was aware that Frontline was going to put up a, a story, um, and uh, the and Frontline just took it on face value that uh, that two rems or, or twenty millisieverts uh, was essentially inconsequential. Did they? And I went to the National Academy of Sciences uh, bio, uh, uh, biological effects of ionizing radiation report, and it's it's crystal clear that for the entire population, that means that one out of every 500 people will get a cancer. But that for the number that the Japanese have said, and, but, but frontline didn't dig far enough. But what that means is that's, that's people like you and I who are, you know, by, by the time I get a cancer, I'll probably be dead from something else as you're on your old side of that spectrum. Sorry, Helen, we both are. Yeah. But the but when you look at the beer report and you look at the other side of the spectrum, it's actually the young girls who are five times more radiosensitive than the population as a whole. So that means one out of a hundred young girls, every year they're exposed to this, is going to get a cancer at some point in their life from Fukushima. So if a kid is there for five years, you're talking about one out of every 20 young girls. Oh, my God. Essentially, if you look at a classroom full of kids, one out of 20 of those kids is going to get a cancer as a result of Fukushima. And probably when they're they're relatively young. Yes. 